the Moonstone, Part Twenty Nine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone, by Wilkie Collins, read by Christine. The Discovery of the Truth, First Narrative, Chapter Six. Letter One. Miss Clack presents her compliments to Mr. Franklin Blake, and, in sending him the fifth chapter of her humble narrative, begs to say that she feels quite unequal to enlarge as she could wish on an event so awful under the circumstances as Lady Verinder's death. She has, therefore, attached to her own manuscripts copious extracts from precious publications in her possession, all bearing on this terrible subject, and may those extracts, Miss Clark fervently hopes, sound as the blast of a trumpet in the ears of her respected kinsman, Mr. Franklin Blake. Letter 2 Mr. Franklin Blake presents his compliments to Miss Clark, and begs to thank her for the fifth chapter of her narrative. In returning the extract sent with it, he will refrain from mentioning any personal objection which he may entertain to this species of literature and will merely say that the proposed additions to the manuscript are not necessary to the fulfillment of the purpose that he has in view. Letter 3 Miss Clegg begs to acknowledge the return of her extracts. She affectionately reminds Mr. Franklin Blake that she is a Christian, and that it is, therefore, quite impossible for him to offend her. Miss Clark persists in feeling the deepest interest in Mr. Blake, and pledges herself, on the first occasion, when sickness may lay him low, to offer him the use of her extracts for the second time. In the meanwhile, she would be glad to know, before beginning the final chapters of her narrative, whether she may be permitted to make her humble contribution complete, by availing herself of the light which later discoveries have thrown on the mystery of the moonstone. Letter 4 Mr. Franklin Blake is sorry to disappoint Miss Clark. He can only repeat the instructions which he had the honor of giving her when she began her narrative. She is requested to limit herself to her own individual experience of persons and events, as recorded in her diary. Later discoveries she will be good enough to leave to the pens of those persons who can write in the capacity of actual witnesses. Letter 5 Miss Clegg is extremely sorry to trouble Mr. Franklin Blake with another letter. Her extracts have not been returned, and the expression of her matured views on the subject of the moonstone has been forbidden. Miss Clark is painfully conscious that she ought, in the worldly phrase, to feel herself put down. But no, Miss Clark has learned perseverance in the school of adversity. Her object in writing is to know whether Mr. Blake, who prohibits everything else, prohibits the appearance of the present correspondence in Miss Clark's narrative. Some explanation of the position in which Mr. Blake's interference has placed her as an authoress seems due on the ground of common justice, and Miss Clack, on her side, is most anxious that her letters should be produced to speak for themselves. Letter 6 Mr. Franklin Blake agrees to Miss Clack's proposal, on the understanding that she will kindly consider this intimation of his consent as closing the correspondence between them. Letter 7. Miss Clark feels it an act of Christian duty, before the correspondence closes, to inform Mr. Franklin Blake that his last letter, evidently intended to offend her, has not succeeded in accomplishing the object of the writer. She affectionately requests Mr. Blake to retire to the privacy of his own room, and to consider with himself whether the training which can thus elevate a poor weak woman above the reach of insult be not worthy of greater admiration that he is now disposed to feel for it. On being favored with an intimation to that effect, Miss Clark solemnly pledges herself to send back the complete series of her extracts to Mr. Franklin Blake. To this letter no answer was received. Comment is needless. Signed, Drusilla Clark. Chapter 7 The foregoing correspondence will sufficiently explain why no choice is left to me but to pass over Lady Verinder's death with a simple announcement of the fact which ends my fifth chapter. 
keeping myself for the future strictly within the limits of my own personal experience, I have next to relate that a month elapsed from the time of my aunt's decease before Rachel Verinder and I met again. That meeting was the occasion of my spending a few days under the same roof with her. In the course of my visit something happened, relative to her marriage engagement with Mr. Godfrey Applewhite, which is important enough to require special notice in these pages. When this last of many painful family circumstances had been disclosed, my task will be completed, for I shall then have told all that I know as an actual and most unwilling witness of events. My aunt's remains were removed from London and were buried in the little cemetery attached to the church in her own park. I was invited to the funeral with the rest of the family, but it was impossible, with my religious views, to rouse myself in a few days only from the shock which this death had caused me. I was informed, moreover, that the rector of Frising Hall was to read the service. Having myself in past times seen this clerical castaway making one of the players at Lady Swearinder's whist table, I doubt, even if I had been fit to travel, whether I should have felt justified in attending the ceremony. Lady Verinder's death left her daughter under the care of her brother-in-law, Mr. Abelwhite the Elder. He was appointed guardian by the will, until his niece married, or came of age. Under these circumstances, Mr. Godfrey informed his father, I suppose, of the new relation in which he stood towards Rachel. At any rate, in ten days from my aunt's death, the secret of the marriage engagement was no secret at all, within the circle of the family, and the grand question for Mr. Abelwhat Sr., another confirmed castaway, was how to make himself and his authority most agreeable to the wealthy young lady who was going to marry his son. Rachel gave him some trouble at the outset, about the choice of a place in which she could be prevailed upon to reside. The house in Montagu Square was associated with the calamity of her mother's death. The house in Yorkshire was associated with the scandalous affair of the last moonstone. Her guardian's own residence at Frising Hall was open to neither of those objections. But Rachel's presence in it, after her recent bereavement, operated as a check on the gaieties of her cousin, the Miss Abelwhites, and she herself requested that her visit might be deferred to a more favorable opportunity. It ended in a proposal, emanating from old Mr. Abelwhite, to try a furnished house at Brighton. His wife, an invalid daughter, and Rachel were to inhabit it together, and were to expect him to join them later in the season. They would see no society but a few old friends, and they would have his son Godfrey, travelling backwards and forwards by the London train, always at their disposal. I describe this aimless flitting about from one place of residence to another, this incessant restlessness of body, and appalling stagnation of soul, merely with the view to arriving at results. The event which, under Providence, proved to be the means of bringing Rachel Verinder and myself together again, was no other than the hiring of the house at Brighton. My aunt Abelwhite is a large, silent, fair-complexioned woman, with one noteworthy point in her character. From the hour of her birth she has never been known to do anything for herself. She has gone through life accepting everybody's help and adopting everybody's opinions. A more hopeless person, in a spiritual point of view, I have never met with. There is absolutely... In this perplexing case, no obstructive material to work upon. Aunt Abelwhite would listen to the Grand Lama of Tibet exactly as she listens to me, and would reflect his views quite as readily as she reflects mine. She found the furnished house at Brighton by stopping at an hotel in London, composing herself on a sofa, and sending for her son. She discovered the necessary servants by breakfasting in bed one morning, still at the hotel and giving her maid a holiday on condition that the girl would be enjoying herself by fetching Miss Gluck. I found her placidly fanning herself in her dressing gown at eleven o'clock. Drusilla, dear, I want some servants. You are so clever. Please get them for me. I looked round the untidy room. The church bells were going for a weekday service. They suggested a word of affectionate remonstrance on my part. Oh, aunt, I said sadly. Is this worthy of a Christian Englishwoman? 
Is the passage from time to eternity to be made in this manner? My aunt answered, I'll put on my gown, Drusilla, if you will be kind enough to help me. What was to be said after that? I have done wonders with murderesses. I have never advanced an inch with Aunt Abelwhite. Where is the list, I asked, of the servants whom you require? My aunt shook her head. She hadn't even energy enough to keep the list. Rachel has got it, dear, she said, in the next room. I went into the next room and saw, saw Rachel again for the first time since we had parted in Montagu Square. She looked pitiably small and thin in her deep mourning. If I attached any serious importance to such a perishable trifle as personal appearance, I might be inclined to add that hers was one of those unfortunate complexions which always suffer when not relieved by a border of white next the skin. But what are our complexions and our looks? Hydrances and pitfalls, dear girls, which beset us on our way to higher things. Greatly to my surprise, Rachel rose when I entered the room and came forward to meet me with outstretched hand. "'I am glad to see you,' she said. "'Drasilla, I have been in the habit of speaking very foolishly and very rudely to you on former occasions. I beg your pardon. I hope you will forgive me.' My face, I suppose, betrayed the astonishment I felt at this. She colored up for a moment and then proceeded to explain herself. "'In my poor mother's lifetime,' she went on, her friends were not always my friends, too. Now I have lost her. My heart turns for comfort to the people she liked. She liked you. Try to be friends with me, Drusilla, if you can. To any rightly constituted mind, the motive thus acknowledged was simply shocking. Here in Christian England was a young woman in a state of bereavement, with so little idea of where to look for true comfort, that she actually expected to find it among her mother's friends. Here was a relative of mine, awakened to a sense of her shortcomings toward others, under the influence not of conviction and duty, but of sentiment and impulse. Most deplorable to think of, but, still, suggestive of something hopeful, to a person of my experience in plying the good work. There could be no harm, I thought, in ascertaining the extent of the change which the loss of her mother has wrought in Rachel's character. I decided, as a useful test, to probe her on the subject of her marriage engagement to Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. Having first met her advances with all possible cordiality, I sat by her on the sofa at her own request. We discussed family affairs and future plans, always expecting that one future plan which was to end in her marriage. Try as I might to turn the conversation that way, she resolutely declined to take the hint. Any open reference to the question on my part would have been premature at this early stage of our reconciliation. Besides, I had discovered all I wanted to know. She was no longer the reckless, defiant creature whom I had heard and seen on the occasion of my martyrdom in Montagu Square. This was, of itself, enough to encourage me to take her future conversion in hand, beginning with a few words of earnest warning directed against the hasty forming of the marriage tie and so getting on the higher things. Looking at her now, with this new interest, and calling to mind the headlong suddenness with which he had met Mr. Godfrey's matrimonial views, I felt the solemn duty of interfering with a fervor which assured me that I should achieve no common results. Rapidity of proceeding was, as I believed, of importance in this case. I went back at once to the question of the servants wanted for the furnished house. Where is the list, dear? Rachel produced it. Cook, kitchen maid, housemaid, and footman, I read. My dear Rachel, these servants are only wanted for a term, the term during which your garden has taken the house. We shall have great difficulty in finding persons of character and capacity to accept a temporary engagement of that sort, if we try in London. Has the house in Brighton been found yet? Yes. Godfrey has taken in, and persons in the house wanted him to hire them as servants. He thought they would hardly do for us, and came back having settled nothing. And you have no experience yourself in these matters, Rachel? None whatever. And Aunt Oblwhite won't exert herself. No, poor dear, don't blame her, Drusilla. I think she is the only really happy woman I have ever met with. There are degrees in happiness, darling. 
We must have a little talk some day on that subject. In the meantime, I will undertake to meet the difficulty about the servants. Your aunt will write a letter to the people of the house. She will sign a letter if I write it for her, which comes to be the same thing. Quite the same thing. I shall get the letter, and I will go to Brighton tomorrow. How extremely kind of you! We will join you as soon as you are ready for us. And you will stay, I hope, as my guest. Brighton is so lively, you are sure to enjoy it. In those words the invitation was given, and the glorious prospect of interference was opened before me. It was then the middle of the week. By Saturday afternoon the house was ready for them. In that short interval I had sifted, not the characters only, but the religious views as well, of all the disengaged servants who applied to me, and had succeeded in making a selection which my conscience approved. I also discovered and called on two serious friends of mine, residents in the town, to whom I knew I could confide the pious object which had brought me to Brighton. One of them, a clerical friend, kindly helped me to take sittings for our little party in the church in which he himself ministered. The other, a single lady, like myself, placed the resources of her library, composed throughout of precious publications, entirely at my disposal. I borrowed half a dozen works, all carefully chosen with a view to Rachel. When these had been judiciously distributed in the various rooms she would be likely to occupy, I considered that my preparations were complete. Sound doctrine in the servants who waited on her, sound doctrine in the minister who preached to her, sound doctrine in the books that lay on her table. Such was the triple welcome which my zeal had prepared for the motherless girl. A heavenly composure filled my mind on that Saturday afternoon, as I sat at the window waiting the arrival of my relatives. The giddy throng passed and repassed before my eyes. Alas, how many of them felt my exquisite sense of duty done! An awful question. Let us not pursue it. Between six and seven the travellers arrived. To my indescribable surprise they were escorted not by Mr. Godfrey, as I had anticipated, but by the lawyer, Mr. Bruff. "'How do you do, Miss Clark?' he said. "'I mean to stay this time.' That reference to the occasion on which I had obliged him to postpone his business to mine, when we were both visiting in Montagu Square, satisfied me that the old wardling had come to Brighton with some object of his own in view. I had prepared quite a little paradise for my beloved Rachel, and here was the serpent already. Godfrey was very much vexed, Drusilla, not to be able to come with us, said my aunt Abelwhite. There was something in the way which kept him in town. Mr. Bruff volunteered to take his place, and make a holiday of it till Monday morning. By the by, Mr. Bruff, I am ordered to take exercise, and I don't like it. That, added aunt Abelwhite, pointing out of window to an invalid, going by in a chair on wheels, drawn by a man, is my idea of exercise. If it's air you want, you get it in your chair, and if it's fatigue you want, I'm sure it's fatigue enough to look at the man. Rachel stood silent at a window by herself, with her eyes fixed on the sea. Tired, love? I inquired. No, only a little out of spirits, she answered. I have often seen the sea, on our Yorkshire coast, with that light on it, and I was thinking, Drusilla, of the days that can never come again. Mr. Braff remained to dinner, and stayed through the evening. The more I saw him, the more certain I felt that he had some private end to serve in coming to Brighton. I watched him carefully. He maintained the same appearance of ease, and talked the same godless gossip, hour after hour, until it was time to take leave. As she shook hands with Rachel, I caught his hard and cunning eyes resting on her for a moment, with a peculiar interest and attention. She was plainly concerned in the object that he had in view. He said nothing out of the common to her or to anyone on leaving. He invited himself to luncheon on the next day, and then he went away to his hotel. It was impossible the next morning to get my aunt Abelwhite out of her dressing gown in time for church. Her invalid daughter, suffering from nothing in my opinion but incurable laziness inherited from her mother, announced that she meant to remain in bed for the day. Rachel and I went alone together to church. A magnificent sermon was preached by my gifted friend on the heathen indifference of the world to the sinfulness of little sins. 
For more than an hour his eloquence, assisted by his glorious voice, thundered through the sacred edifice. I said to Rachel when we came out, "'Has it found its way to your heart, dear?' And she answered, "'No, it has only made my head ache.' This might have been discouraging to some people, but, once embarked on a career of manifest usefulness, nothing discourages me. We found out Abelwhite and Mr. Bruff at luncheon. When Rachel declined eating anything and gave us a reason for it that she was suffering from a headache, the lawyer's cunning instantly saw and seized the chance that she had given him. "'There is only one remedy for a headache,' said this horrible old man. "'A walk, Miss Rachel, is a thing to cure you. I am entirely at your service if you will honor me by accepting my arm.' "'With the greatest pleasure. A walk is the very thing I was longing for.' "'It's past two, I gently suggested, "'and the afternoon service Rachel begins at three. "'How can you expect me to go to church again?' "'she asked petulantly. "'With such a headache as mine!' "'Mr. Bruff officiously opened the door for her. "'In another minute more they were both out of the house. "'I don't know when I have felt the solemn duty "'of interfering so strongly as I felt it at the moment. "'But what was to be done? "'Nothing was to be done.' but to interfere at the first opportunity, later in the day. On my return from the afternoon service, I found that they had just got back. One look at them told me that the lawyer had said what he wanted to say. I had never before seen Rachel so silent and so thoughtful. I had never before seen Mr. Bruff pay her such devoted attention, and look at her with such marked respect. He had, or pretended that he had, an engagement to dinner that day, and he took an early leave of us all, intending to go back to London by the first train the next morning. "'Are you sure of your own resolution?' he said to Rachel at the door. "'Quite sure,' she answered, and so they parted. The moment his back was turned, Rachel withdrew to her own room. She never appeared at dinner. Her maid, the person with the cap ribbons, was sent downstairs to announce that her headache had returned.' I ran up to her and made all sorts of sisterly offers through the door. It was locked, and she kept it locked. Plenty of obstructive material to work on here. I felt greatly cheered and stimulated by her locking the door. When her cup of tea went up to her the next morning, I followed it in. I sat by her bedside and said a few earnest words. She listened with languid civility. I noticed my serious friend's precious publications huddled together on a table in a corner, had she chanced to look into them? I asked. Yes, and they had not interested her. Would she allow me to read a few passages of the deepest interest, which had probably escaped her eye? No, not now. She had other things to think of. She gave these answers with her attention apparently absorbed in folding and refolding the, the frilling on her nightgown. It was plainly necessary to rouse her by some reference to those worldly interests, which she still had at heart. "'Do you know, love,' I said, "'I had an odd fancy yesterday about Mr. Bruff. "'I thought, when I saw you after your walk with him, "'that he had been telling you some bad news.' "'Her fingers dropped from the trifling of her nightgown, "'and her fierce black eyes flashed at me. "'Quite the contrary,' she said. "'It was news I was interested in hearing, "'and I am deeply indebted to Mr. Bruff for telling me of it.' "'Yes,' I said, in a tone of gentle interest.' Her fingers went back to the trifling, and she turned her head sullenly away from me. I had been met in this manner, in the course of plying the good work hundreds of times. She merely stimulated me to try again. In my dauntless zeal for her welfare, I ran the great risk and openly allude to her marriage engagement. "'News you were interested in hearing,' I repeated. "'I suppose, my dear Rachel, that must be news of Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite.' She started up in the bed, and turned deadly pale. It was evidently on the tip of her tongue to retort on me with the unbrilled insolence of former times. She checked herself, laid her head back on the pillow, considered a minute, and then answered in these remarkable words. I shall never marry Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. It was my turn to start at that. What can you possibly mean? I exclaimed. The marriage is considered by the whole family as a settled thing. Mr. Godfrey Applewhite is expected here today, she said doggedly. Wait till he comes, and you will see. But, my dear Rachel, 
she rang the bell at the head of her bed. The person with the cab ribbons appeared. Penelope, my bath, let me give her her due. In the state of my feelings at that moment, I do sincerely believe that she had hit on the only possible way of forcing me to leave the room. But the mere worldly mind my position towards Rachel might have been viewed as presenting difficulties of no ordinary kind. I had reckoned on leading her to higher things by means of a little earnest exhortation on the subject of her marriage. And now, if she was to be believed, no such event as her marriage was to take place at all. But ah, my friends, a working Christian of my experience, with an evangelizing prospect before her, takes broader views than these. Supposing Rachel really broke off the marriage, on which the Abelwhites, father and son, counted as a settled thing, what would be the result? It could only end, if she held firm, in an exchanging of hard words and bitter accusations on both sides. And what would be the effect on Rachel when the stormy interview was over? A salutary moral depression would be the effect. Her pride would be exhausted, her stubbornness would be exhausted, by the resolute resistance which it was in her character to make under the circumstances. She would turn for sympathy to the nearest person who had sympathy to offer, and I was the nearest person, brimful of comfort, charged to overflowing with reasonable and reviving words. Never had the evangelizing prospect looked brighter to my eyes than it looked now. She came down to breakfast, but she ate nothing, and hardly uttered a word. After breakfast she wandered listlessly from room to room, then suddenly roused herself and opened the piano. The music she selected to play was of the most scandalously profane sort, associated with performances on the stage which it curdles one's blood to think of. It would have been premature to interfere with her at such a time as this. I privately ascertained the hour at which Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite was expected, and then I escaped the music by leaving the house. Being out alone, I took the opportunity of calling upon my two resident friends. It was an indescribable luxury to find myself indulging in earnest conversation with serious persons. Infinitely encouraged and refreshed, I turned my steps back again to the house, in excellent time to await the arrival of our expected visitor. I entered the dining-room, always empty at that hour of the day, and found myself face to face with Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. He made no attempt to fly the place. Quite the contrary. He advanced to meet me with the utmost eagerness. Dear Miss Clark, I have been only waiting to see you. Chance set me free of my London engagements today sooner than I had expected, and I have got here, in consequence earlier than my appointed time. Not the slightest embarrassment encumbered his explanation, though this was his first meeting with me after the scene in Montagu Square. He was not aware, it's true, of my having been a witness of that scene. But he knew, on the other hand, that my attendances at the mother's small clothes and my relations with friends attached to other charities must have informed me of his shameless neglect of his ladies and of his poor. And yet there he was before me, in full possession of his charming voice and his irresistible smile. "'Have you seen Rachel yet?' I asked. He sighed gently and took me by the hand. I should certainly have snatched my hand away if the manner in which he gave his answer had not paralyzed me with astonishment. "'I have seen Rachel,' he said with perfect tranquillity. You are aware, dear friend, that she was engaged to me. Well, she has taken a sudden resolution to break the engagement. Reflection has convinced her that she will best consult her welfare and mine by retracing a rash promise and leaving me free to make some happier choice elsewhere. That is the only reason she will give, and the only answer she will make to every question that I can ask of her. What have you done on your side? I inquired. Have you submitted? Yes, he said, with the most unruffled composure. I have submitted. His conduct under the circumstances was so utterly inconceivable that I stood bewildered with my hand in his. It is a piece of rudeness to stare at anybody, and it is an act of indelicacy to stare at a gentleman. I committed both those improprieties. And I said, as if in a dream, What does it mean? Permit me to tell you, he replied. And suppose we sit down. He led me to a chair. I have an indistinct remembrance that he was very affectionate. 
I don't think he put his arm round my waist to support me, but I'm not sure. I was quite helpless, and his ways with ladies were very endearing. At any rate, we sat down. I can answer for that, if I can answer for nothing more. End of part 29「The Moonstone」Part 30 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins Read by Christine The Discovery of the Truth First Narrative Chapter 8 I have lost a beautiful girl, an excellent social position, and a handsome income, Mr. Godfrey began, and I have submitted to it without a struggle. What can be the motive for such extraordinary conduct as that? My precious friend, there is no motive. No motive, I repeated. Let me appeal, my dear Miss Clack, to your experience of children, he went on. A child pursues a certain course of conduct. You are greatly struck by it, and you attempt to get at the motive. The dear little thing is incapable of telling you its motive. You might as well ask the grass why it grows, or the birds why they sing. Well, in this matter, I am like the dear little thing, like the grass, like the birds. I don't know why I made a proposal of marriage to Miss Verinder. I don't know why I have shamefully neglected my dear ladies. I don't know why I have apostatized from the mother's small clothes. You say to the child, Why have you been naughty? And the little angel puts its fingers into its mouth and doesn't know. My case exactly, Miss Clark. I couldn't confess it to anybody else. I feel impelled to confess it to you. I began to recover myself. A mental problem was involved here. I am deeply interested in mental problems, and I am not, it is thought, without some skill in solving them. "'Best of friends, exert your intellect and help me,' he proceeded. "'Tell me, why does the time come when these matrimonial proceedings of mine begin to look like something done in a dream? Why does it suddenly occur to me that my true happiness is in helping my dear ladies, in going my modest round of useful work, in saying my few earnest words when called on by my chairman? What do I want with a position? I have got a position. What do I want with an income?' I can pay for my bread and cheese, and my nice little lodging, and my two coats a year. What do I want with Miss Verinder? She has told me with her own lips, this dear lady is between ourselves, that she loves another man, and that her only idea in marrying me is to try and put that other man out of her head. What a horrid union is this! Oh, dear me, what a horrid union is this! Such are my reflections, Miss Clark, on my way to Brighton. I approach Rachel with the feeling of a criminal who is going to receive his sentence. When I find that she has changed her mind too, when I hear her propose to break the engagement, I experience, there is no sort of doubt about it, a most overpowering sense of relief. A month ago I was pressing her repetitiously to my bosom. An hour ago the happiness of knowing that I shall never press her again intoxicates me like strong liquor. The thing seems impossible, the thing can't be. And yet there are the facts, as I had the honour of stating them when we first sat down together in these two chairs. I have lost a beautiful girl, an excellent social position, and a handsome income, and I have submitted to it without a struggle. Can you account for it, dear friend? It's quite beyond me. His magnificent head sunk on his breast, and he gave up his own mental problem in despair. I was deeply touched. The case, if I may speak as a spiritual physician— was now quite plain to me. It is no uncommon event, in the experience of us all, to see the possessors of exalted ability occasionally humbled to the level of the most poorly gifted people about them. The object, no doubt, in the wise economy of providence, is to remind greatness that it is, and that the power which has conferred it can also take it away. It was now to my mind easy to discern one of these salutary humiliations in the deplorable proceedings on dear Mr. Godfrey's part, of which I had been the unseen witness. 
and it was equally easy to recognize the welcome reappearance of his own finer nature in the horror with which he recoiled from the idea of a marriage with Rachel, and in the charming eagerness which she showed to return to his ladies and his poor. I put this view before him in a few simple and sisterly words. His joy was beautiful to see. He compared himself, as I went on, to a lost man emerging from the darkness into the light. When I answered for a loving reception of him at the mother's small clothes, the grateful heart of our Christian hero overflowed. He pressed my hands alternately to his lips. Overwhelmed by the exquisitive triumph of having got him back among us, I let him do what he liked with my hands. I closed my eyes. I felt my head in an ecstasy of spiritual self-forgetfulness, sinking on his shoulder. In a moment more I should certainly have swooned away in his arms, but for an interruption from the outer world, which brought me to myself again. A horrid rattling of knives and forks sounded outside the door, and the footman came in to lay the table for luncheon. Mr. Godfrey started up and looked at the clock on the mantelpiece. "'How time flies with you!' he exclaimed. "'I shall barely catch the train.' I ventured on asking why he was in such a hurry to get back to town. His answer reminded me of family difficulties that were still to be reconciled, and of family disagreements that were yet to come. "'I have heard from my father,' he said. "'Business obliges him to leave Rising Hall for London today, and he proposes coming on here, either this evening or tomorrow.' I must tell him what has happened between Rachel and me. His heart is set on our marriage. There will be great difficulty, I fear, in reconciling him to the breaking off of the engagement. I must stop him for all our sakes from coming here till he is reconciled. Best and dearest of friends, we shall meet again. With those words he hurried out. In equal haste on my side, I ran upstairs to compose myself in my own room before meeting Aunt Abelwhite and Rachel at the luncheon table. I am well aware, to dwell for a moment yet on the subject of Mr. Godfrey, that the all profaning opinion of the world has charged him with having his own private reasons for releasing Rachel from her engagement, at the first opportunity she gave him. It has also reached my ears, that his anxiety to recover his place in my estimation has been attributed, in certain quarters, to a mercenary eagerness to make his peace, through me, with a venerable committee, woman at the mother's small clothes, abundantly blessed with the goods of this world, and a beloved and intimate friend of my own. I only noticed these odious slanders for the sake of declaring that they never had a moment's influence on my mind. In obedience to my instructions, I have exhibited the fluctuations in my opinion of our Christian hero, exactly as I find them recorded in my diary. In justice to myself, let me here add that, once restrained in his place in my estimation, my gifted friend never lost that place again. I write with the tears in my eyes, burning to say more. But no, I am cruelly limited to my actual experience of persons and things. In less than a month from the time of which I am now writing, events in the money market, which diminished even my miserable little income, forced me into foreign exile, and left me with nothing but a loving remembrance of Mr. Godfrey, which the slander of the world has assailed, and assailed in vain. Let me dry my eyes, and return to my narrative. I went downstairs to luncheon, naturally anxious to see how Rachel was affected by her release from her marriage engagement. It appeared to me, but I own I am a poor authority in such matters, that the recovery of her freedom had set her thinking again of that other man whom she loved, and that she was furious with herself for not being able to control a revulsion of feeling of which she was secretly ashamed. Who was the man? I had my suspicions, but it was needless to waste time in idle speculation. When I had converted her, she would, as a matter of course, have no concealments from me. I should hear all about the man, I should hear all about the moonstone. If I had had no higher object in stirring her up to a sense of spiritual things, the motive of relieving her mind of its guilty secrets would have been enough of itself to encourage me to go on. Aunt Abelwhite took her exercise in the afternoon in an invalid chair. Rachel accompanied her. I wish I could drag the chair, she broke out recklessly. I wish I could fatigue myself till I was ready to drop. She was in the same humor in the evening. I discovered in one of my friend's precious publications 
The Life, Letters, and Labors of Miss Jane Ann Stamper, 44th edition. Passages which bore with a marvelous appropriateness on Rachel's present position. Upon my proposing to read them, she went to the piano. Conceive how little she must have known of serious people, if she supposed that my patience was to be exhausted in that way. I kept Miss Jane Ann Stamper by me, and waited for events with the most unfaltering trust in the future. Old Mr. Abelwhite never made his appearance that night, but I knew the importance which his worldly greed attached to his son's marriage with Miss Verinder, and I felt a positive conviction, do what Mr. Godfrey might to prevent it, that we should see him the next day. With his interference in the matter, the storm on which I had counted would certainly come, and the salutary exhaustion of Rachel's resisting powers would as certainly follow. I am not ignorant that old Mr. Abelwhite has the reputation generally, especially among his inferiors, of being a remarkably good-natured man. According to my observation of him, he deserves his reputation as long as he has his own way, and not a moment longer. The next day, exactly as I had foreseen, Aunt Abelwhite was as near to being astonished as her nature would permit, by the sudden appearance of her husband. He had barely been a minute in the house before he was followed, to my astonishment, this time, by an unexpected complication in the shape of Mr. Bruff. I never remember feeling the presence of the lawyer to be more unwelcome than I felt it at that moment. He looked ready for anything in the way of an obstructive proceeding, capable even of keeping the peace with Rachel for one of the combatants. "'This is a pleasant surprise, sir,' said Mr. Abelwhite, addressing himself with his decaptive cordiality to Mr. Bruff. "'When I left your office yesterday, I didn't expect to have the honour of seeing you at Brighton today. "'I turned over our conversation in my mind after you had gone,' replied Mr. Bruff, "'and it occurred to me that I might perhaps be of some use on this occasion.' I was just in time to catch the train, and I had no opportunity of discovering the carriage in which you were travelling. Having given that explanation, he seated himself by Rachel. I retired modestly to a corner, with Miss Jane Ann Stamper on my lap, in case of emergency. My aunt sat at the window, placidly fanning herself as usual. Mr. Abelwhite stood up in the middle of the room, with his bald head much pinker than I had ever seen it yet, and addressed himself in the most affectionate manner to his niece. "'Rachel, my dear,' he said, "'I have heard some very extraordinary news from Godfrey, and I am here to inquire about it. You have a sitting-room of your own in this house. Will you honour me by showing me the way to it?' Rachel never moved. Whether she was determined to bring matters to a crisis, or whether she was prompted to some private sign from Mr. Bruff, is more than I can tell. She declined doing old Mr. Abelwhite the honour of conducting him into her sitting-room. "'Whatever you wish to say to me,' she answered, "'can be said here, in the presence of my relatives, "'and in the presence,' she looked at Mr. Bruff, "'of my mother's trusted old friend.' "'Just as you please, my dear,' said the amiable Mr. Abelwhite. He took a chair. The rest of them looked at his face, as if they expected it, after seventy years of worldly training, to speak the truth. I looked at the top of his bald head, having noticed on other occasions that the temper, which was really in him, had a habit of registering itself there. Some weeks ago, pursued the old gentleman, my son informed me that Miss Verinder had done him the honour to engage herself to marry him. Is it possible, Rachel, that he can have misinterpreted or presumed upon what you really said to him? Certainly not, she replied. I did engage myself to marry him. "'Very frankly answered,' said Mr. Abelwhite, "'and most satisfactory, my dear, so far. "'In respect to what happened some weeks since, "'Godfrey has made no mistake. "'The error is evidently in what he told me yesterday. "'I begin to see it now. "'You and he have had a lover's quarrel, "'and my foolish son has interpreted it seriously. "'Ah, I should have known better than that at his age.' "'The fallen nature in Rachel, the mother Eve, so to speak, began to chafe at this. "'Pray let us understand each other, Mr. Applewhite,' she said. "'Nothing in the least like a quarrel took place yesterday between your son and me. "'If he told you that I proposed breaking off our marriage engagement, "'and that he agreed on his side, he told you the truth.' 
The self-registering thermometer at the top of Mr. Abelwhite's bald head began to indicate a rise of temper. His face was more amiable than ever, but there was the pink of the top of his face, a shade deeper already. "'Come, come, my dear,' he said in his most soothing manner. "'Now don't be angry, and don't be hard on poor Godfrey. He has evidently said some unfortunate thing. He was always clumsy from a child, but he means well, Rachel, he means well.' "'Mr. Abelwhite, I have either expressed myself very badly, or you are purposely mistaking me. Once for all, it is a settled thing between your son and myself that we remain, for the rest of our lives, cousins and nothing more. Is that plain enough?' The tone in which she said these words made it impossible, even for old Mr. Abelwhite, to mistake her any longer. His thermometer went up another degree, and his voice went he next spoke, ceased to be the voice which is appropriate to a notoriously good-natured man. "'I am to understand, then,' he said, "'that your marriage engagement is broken off.' "'You are to understand that, Mr. Abelwhite, if you please.' "'I am also to take it as a matter of fact that the proposal to withdraw from the engagement came in the first instance from you.' "'It came in the first instance from me.' and it met, as I have told you, with your son's consent and approval. The thermometer went up to the top of the register. I mean the pink changed suddenly to a scarlet. My son is a mean-spirited hound, cried this furious old worling. In justice to myself as his father, not in justice to him, I beg to ask you, Miss Verinder, what complaint you have to make of Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. Here Mr. Bruff interfered for the first time. "'You are not bound to answer that question,' he said to Rachel. Old Mr. Abelwhite fastened on him instantly. "'Don't forget, sir,' he said, "'that you are a self-invited guest here. "'Your interference would have come with a better grace "'if you had waited until it was asked for.' Mr. Bruff took no notice. The smooth varnish on his wicked old face never cracked. Rachel thanked him for the advice he had given to her, and then turned to old Mr. Abelwhite preserving her composure in a manner which, having regard to her age and her sex, was simply awful to see. "'Your son put the same question to me which you have just asked,' she said. "'I had only one answer for him, and I have only one answer for you. I proposed that we should release each other, because reflection had convinced me that I should best consult his welfare and mine by retracing a rash promise, and leaving him free to make his choice elsewhere.' "'What has my son done?' persisted Mr. Abelwhite. "'I have a right to know that. What has my son done?' She persisted just as obstinately on her side. "'You have had the only explanation which I think it's necessary to give to you, or to him,' she answered. "'In plain English, it's your sovereign will and pleasure, Miss Garinder, to jilt my son.' Rachel was silent for a moment. Sitting close behind her, I heard her sigh. Mr. Bruff took her hand and gave it a little squeeze. She recovered herself and answered Mr. Abelwhite as boldly as ever. "'I have exposed myself to worse misconstructions than that,' she said, "'and I have borne it patiently. The time has gone by when you could mortify me by calling me a jilt.' She spoke with a bitterness of tone which satisfied me that the scandal of the moonstone had been in some way recalled to her mind. "'I have no more to say.' she added wearily, not addressing the words to anyone in particular, and looking away from us all, out of the window that was nearest to her. Mr. Abelwhite got upon his feet and pushed away his chair so violently that it toppled over and fell on the floor. "'I have something more to say on my side,' he announced, bringing down the flat of his hand on the table with a bang. "'I have to say that if my son doesn't feel this insult, I do.' Rachel started and looked at him in a sudden surprise. Insult? she repeated. What do you mean? Insult, reiterated Mr. Abelwhite. I know your motive, Miss Verinder, for breaking your promise to my son. I know it is certainly as if you had confessed it in so many words. Your cursed family pride is insulting Godfrey, as it insulted me when I married your aunt. Her family, her beggarly family, turned their backs on her for marrying an honest man, who had made his own place and won his own fortune. I had no ancestors. I wasn't descended from a set of cutthroat scoundrels who lived by robbery and murder. 
I couldn't point to the time when the Abelwhites hadn't a shirt to their backs, and couldn't sign their own names. Ha ha! I wasn't good enough for the Herncastles when I married, and now it comes to the pinch my son isn't good enough for you. I suspected it all along. You have got the Herncast blood in you, my young lady. I have suspected it all along. A very unworthy suspicion, remarked Mr. Bruff. I am astonished that you have the courage to acknowledge it. Before Mr. Abelwhite could find words to answer in, Rachel spoke in a tone of the most exasperating contempt. Surely, she said to the lawyer, this is beneath notice. If he can think in that way, let us leave him to think as he pleases. From Scarlet, Mr. Abelwhite was now becoming purple. He gasped for breath. He looked backwards and forwards from Rachel to Mr. Bruff, in such a frenzy of rage with both of them, that he didn't know which to attack first. His wife, who had sat impenetrably fanning herself up to this time, began to be alarmed, and attempted quite uselessly to quiet him. I had, throughout this distressing interview, felt more than one inward call to interfere with a few earnest words, and had controlled myself under a dread of the possible results, very unworthy of a Christian Englishwoman, who looks not to what is meanly prudent, but to what is morally right. At the point at which matters had now arrived, I rose superior to all considerations of mere expediency. If I had contemplated interposing any remonstrance of my own humble devising, I might possibly have still hesitated. But the distressing domestic emergency which now confronted me was most marvelously and beautifully provided for in the correspondence of Miss Jane Ann Stamper, Letter 1001, on Peace in Families. I rose in my modest corner, and I opened my precious book. "'Dear Mr. Abelwhite, I said, one word. When I first attracted the attention of the company by rising, I could see that he was on the point of saying something rude to me. My sisterly form of address checked him. He started at me in his astonishment. "'As an affectionate well-wisher and friend,' I proceeded, and as one long accustomed to arouse, convince, prepare, enlighten, and fortify others, permit me to take the most pardonable of all liberties, the liberty of composing your mind. He began to recover himself. He was on the point of breaking out. He would have broken out with anybody else. But my voice, habitually gentle, possesses a high note of so in emergencies. In this emergency, I felt imperatively called upon to have the highest voice of the two. I held up my precious book before him. I wrapped the open page impressively with my forefinger. Not my words, I exclaimed in a burst of fervent interruption. Oh, don't suppose that I claim attention for my humble words. Manna in the wilderness, Mr. Abelwhite. Do on the perched earth. Words of comfort, words of wisdom, words of love, the blessed, blessed, blessed words of Miss Jane Ann's temper. I was stopped there by a momentary impediment of the breath. Before I could recover myself, this monster in human form shouted out furiously, Miss Jane and Stamper B. It is impossible for me to write the awful word which is here represented by a blank. I shrieked as it passed his lips. I flew to my little bag on the side table. I shook out all my tracts. I seized the one particular tract on profound swearing, entitled, Hush for Heaven's Sake. I handed it to him with an expression of agonized entreaty. He tore it in two, and threw it back at me across the table. The rest of them rose in alarm, not knowing what might happen next. I instantly sat down again in my corner. There had once been an occasion, under somewhat similar circumstances, when Miss Jane Ann's temper had been taken by the two shoulders and turned out of the room. I waited, inspired by her spirit, for a repetition of her martyrdom. But no, it was not to be. His wife was the next person whom he addressed. Who, 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 he said, stammering with rage, who asked this impudent fanatic into the house? Did you? Before Aunt Abelwhite could say a word, Rachel answered for her. Miss Clark is here, she said, as my guest. Those words had a singular effect on Mr. Abelwhite. They suddenly changed him from a man in a state of red-hot anger to a man in a state of icy cold contempt. It was plain to everybody that Rachel had said something 
short and plain as her answer had been, which gave him the upper hand of her at last. "'Oh,' he said, "'Miss Cluck is here as your guest in my house?' It was Rachel's turn to lose her temper at that. Her color rose and her eyes brightened fiercely. She turned to the lawyer and, pointing to Mr. Abelwhite, asked haughtily, "'What does he mean?' Mr. Bruff interfered for the third time. "'You appear to forget,' he said, addressing Mr. Abelwhite, "'that you took this house as Miss Verinder's guardian, for Miss Verinder's use.' "'Not quite so fast,' interposed Mr. Abelwhite. "'I have a last word to say, which I should have said some time since. "'If this—' uh, "'He looked my way, pondering what abominable name he should call me. "'If this rampant spinster had not interrupted us. "'I beg to inform you, sir, that, if my son is not good enough to be Miss Verinder's husband, "'I cannot presume to consider his father good enough to be Miss Verinder's guardian.' Understand, if you please, that I refuse to accept the position which is offered to me by Lady Verinder's will. In your legal phrase, I decline to act. This house has necessarily been hired in my name. I take the entire responsibility of it on my shoulders. It is my house. I can keep it or let it just as I please. I have no wish to hurry Miss Verinder. On the contrary, I beg her to remove her guest and her luggage at her own entire convenience. He made a low bow and walked out of the room. That was Mr. Abelwhite's revenge on Rachel for refusing to marry his son. The instant the door closed, Aunt Abelwhite exhibited a phenomenon which silenced us all. She became endowed with energy enough to cross the room. My dear, she said, taking Rachel by the hand, I should be ashamed of my husband if I didn't know that it is his temper which has spoken to you and not himself. You, continued Aunt Abelwhite, turning on me in my corner with another endowment of energy, in her looks this time instead of her limbs. You are the mischievous person who irritated him. I hope I shall never see you or your tracts again. She went back to Rachel and kissed her. I beg your pardon, my dear, she said. In my husband's name, what can I do for you? Consistently perverse in everything, capricious and unreasonable in all the actions of her life, Rachel melted into tears at those commonplace words and returned her aunt's kiss in silence. "'If I may be permitted to answer for Miss Verinder, said Mr. Bruff, "'might I ask you, Mrs. Abelwhite, to send Penelope down with her mistress' bonnet and shawl. "'Leave us ten minutes together,' he added, in a lower tone, "'and you may rely on my setting matters right, to your satisfaction as well as to Rachel's.' The trust of the family in this man was something wonderful to see. Without a word more on her side, Aunt Abelwhite left the room. Ah, said Mr. Bruff, looking after her, the Harncastle blood has its drawbacks, I admit, but as there is something in good breeding after all. Having made that purely worldly remark, he looked hard at my corner, as if he expected me to go. My interest in Rachel, an infinitely higher interest than his, riveted me to my chair. Mr. Bruff gave it up exactly as he had given it up at Aunt Verinder's in Montagu Square. He led Rachel to a chair by the window and spoke to her there. "'My dear young lady,' he said, "'Mr. Abelwhite's conduct has naturally shocked you and taken you by surprise. If it was worth while to contest the question with such a man, we might soon show him that he is not to have things all his own way. But it isn't worth while.' You are quite right in what you said just now. He is beneath our notice. He stopped and looked round at my corner. I sat there quite immovable, with my tracts at my elbow and with Miss Jane Ann's temper on my lap. You know, he resumed, turning back again to Rachel, that it was part of your poor mother's fine nature, always to see the best of the people about her, and never the worst. She named her brother-in-law your guardian because she believed in him, and because she thought it would please her sister. I had never liked Mr. Abelwhite myself, and I induced your mother to let me insert a clause in the will, empowering her executors in certain events to consult with me about the appointment of a new guardian. One of those events has happened today, and I find myself in a position to end all these dry business details, I hope agreeably with a message from my wife. Will you honor Mrs. Bruff by becoming her guest, 
and will you remain under my roof and be one of my family until we wise people have laid our heads together and have settled what is to be done next at those words i rose to interfere mr braff had done exactly what i had dreaded he would do when he asked mrs Ablewhite for rachel's bonnet and shawl before i could interpose a word rachel had accepted his invitation in the warmest terms if i suffered the arrangement thus made between them to be carried out if she once passed the threshold of mr braff's door farewell to the fondest hope of my life the hope of bringing my lost sheep back to the fold the bare idea of such a calamity as this quite overwhelmed me i cast the miserable trammels of worldly discretion to the winds and spoke with the fervor that filled me in the words that came first stop i said stop i must be heard mr braff you are not related to her and i am i invite her i summon the executors to appoint me guardian rachel dearest rachel i offer you my modest home come to london by the next train love and share it with me mr braff said nothing rachel looked at me with a cruel astonishment which she made no effort to conceal you are very kind rosilla she said i shall hope to visit you whenever i happen to be in london but i have accepted mr braff's invitation and i think it will be best for the present if i remain under mr braff's care oh don't say so i pleaded i can't part with you rachel i can't part with you i tried to fold her in my arms but she drew back my fervor did not communicate itself it only alarmed her surely he said this is a very unnecessary display of agitation i don't understand it no more do i said mr braff their hardness their hideous worldly hardness revolted me oh rachel rachel i burst out haven't you seen yet that my heart yearns to make a christian of you has no inner voice told you that i am trying to do for you what i was trying to do for you dear mother when death snatched her out of my hands rachel advanced a step nearer and looked at me very strangely i don't understand your reference to my mother she said miss gluck will you have the goodness to explain yourself before i could answer mr Bruff came forward and offering his arm to rachel tried to lead her out of the room you had better not pursue the subject my dear he said and miss gluck had better not explain herself if i had been a stock or a stone such an interference as this must have roused me into testifying to the truth i put mr Bruff aside indignantly with my own hand and in solemn and suitable language i stated the view with which sound doctrine does not scruple to regard the awful calamity of dying unprepared rachel started back from me i blushed to bright with a scream of horror come away she said to mr Bruff. come away for god's sake before that woman can say any more oh think of my poor mother's harmless useful beautiful life you were at the funeral mr Bruff. you saw how everybody loved her you saw the poor helpless people crying at her grave over the loss of their best friend and that wretch stands there and tries to make me doubt that my mother who was an angel on earth is an angel in heaven now don't stop to talk about it come away it stifles me to breathe the same air with her it frightens me to feel that we are in the same room together deaf to all remonstrance she ran to the door at the same moment her maid entered with her bonnet and shawl she huddled them on anyhow pack my things she said and bring them to mr braff's i attempted to approach her i was shocked and grieved but it is needless to say not offended i only wished to say to her may your hard heart be softened i freely forgive you she pulled down her veil and tore her shawl away from my hand and hurrying out shut the door in my face i bore the insult with my customary fortitude I remember it now with my customary superiority to all feeling of offence. Mr. Bruff had his parting word of mockery for me, before he too hurried out in his turn. "'You had better not have explained yourself, Miss Clack,' he said and bowed, and left the room. The person with the cap ribbons followed. "'It's easy to see who has set them all by the ears together,' she said. "'I'm only a poor servant, but I declare I'm ashamed of you.' she too went out and banged the door after her i was left alone in the room reviled by them all deserted by them all i was left alone in the room is there more to be added to this plain statement of facts to this touching picture of a christian 
persecuted by the world. No, my diary reminds me that one more of the many checkered chapters in my life ends here. From that day forth I never saw Rachel Verinder again. She had my forgiveness at the time when she insulted me. She has had my prayerful good wishes ever since. And when I die, to complete the return on my part of good for evil, she will have the life, letters, and labors of Miss Jane Anne's temper, left her as a legacy by my will. End of Part 30「The Moonstone, Part 31. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone, by Wilkie Collins. Read by Joel Portinger. The Discovery of the Truth. Second Narrative. Contributed by Matthew Bruff, Solicitor of Gray's Inn Square. My fair friend, Miss Clack, having laid down the pen, there are two reasons for my taking it up next, in my turn. In the first place, I am in a position to throw the necessary light on certain points of interest which have thus far been left in the dark. Miss Verinder had her own private reason for breaking her marriage engagement, and I was at the bottom of it. Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite had his own private reason for withdrawing all claim to the hand of his charming cousin, and I discovered what it was. In the second place, it was my good or ill fortune, I hardly know which, to find myself personally involved, at the period of which I am now writing, in the mystery of the Indian diamond. I had the honour of an interview, at my own office, with an oriental stranger of distinguished manners, who is no other, unquestionably, than the chief of the three Indians. Add to this that I met with a celebrated traveller, Mr. Murthwaite, the day afterward, and that I held a conversation with him on the subject of the Moonstone, which has a very important bearing on later events. And there you have the statement of my claims to fill the position which I occupy in these pages. The true story of the broken marriage engagement comes first in point of time, and must therefore take the first place in the present narrative. Tracing my way back along the chain of events, from one end to the other, I find it necessary to open the scene, oddly enough, as you will think, at the bedside of my excellent client and friend, the late Sir John Verinder. Sir John had his share, perhaps a rather large share, of the more harmless and amiable of the weaknesses incidental to humanity. Among these I may mention as applicable to the matter at hand an invincible reluctance, so long as he enjoyed his usual good health, to face the responsibility of making his will. Lady Verinder exerted her influence to rouse him to a sense of duty in this matter, and I exerted my influence. He admitted the justice of our views, but he went no further than that, until he found himself afflicted with the illness which ultimately brought him to his grave. Then I was sent for, at last, to take my client's instructions on the subject of his will. They proved to be the simplest instructions I had ever received in the whole of my professional career. Sir John was dozing when I entered the room. He roused himself at the sight of me. "'How do you do, Mr. Bruff?' he said. "'I shan't be very long about this, and then I'll go to sleep again.' He looked on with great interest while I collected pens, ink, and paper. "'Are you ready?' he asked. I bowed, took a dip of ink, and waited for my instructions. "'Everything to my wife,' said Sir John. "'That's all.' He turned round on his pillow, and composed himself to sleep again. I was obliged to disturb him. "'Am I to understand,' I asked, "'that you leave the whole of the property, of every sort and description, of which you die possessed, absolutely to Lady Verinder?' "'Yes.' said Sir John. Only I put it shorter. Why can't you put it shorter, and let me go to sleep again? Everything to my wife. That's my will. His property was entirely at his own disposal, and was of two kinds. Property in land, I purposely abstain from using technical language, and property in money. In the majority of cases, I am afraid I should have felt it my duty to my client to ask him to reconsider his will, 
in the case of Sir John, I knew Lady Verinder to be not only worthy of the unreserved trust which a husband had placed in her, all good wives are worthy of that, but to be also capable of properly administering a trust, which in my experience of the fair sex, not one in a thousand of them is competent to do. In ten minutes Sir John's will was drawn and executed, and Sir John himself, good man, was finishing his interrupted nap. Lady Verinder amply justified the confidence which her husband had placed in her. In the first days of her widowhood she sent for me and made her will. The view she took of her position was so thoroughly sound and sensible that I was relieved of all necessity for advising her. My responsibility began and ended with shaping her instructions into the proper legal form. Before Sir John had been a fortnight in his grave, the future of his daughter had been most wisely and most affectionately provided for. The will remained in its fireproof box at my office, through more years than I liked to reckon up. It was not till the summer of 1848 that I found occasion to look at it again under very melancholy circumstances. At the date I have mentioned, the doctors pronounced the sentence on poor Lady Verinder, which was literally a sentence of death. I was the first person whom she informed of her situation, and I found her anxious to go over her will again with me. It was impossible to improve the provisions relating to her daughter, but in the lapse of time her wishes in regard to certain minor legacies left to different relatives had undergone some modification, and it became necessary to add three or four codicils to the original document. Having done this at once, for fear of accidents, I obtained her ladyship's permission to embody her recent instructions in a second will. My object was to avoid certain inevitable confusions and repetitions which now disfigured the original document, and which, to own the truth, grated sadly on my professional sense of the fitness of things. The execution of this second will has been described by Miss Clack, who is so obliging as to witness it. So far as regards Rachel Verinder's pecuniary interests, it was, word for word, the exact counterpart of the first will. The only changes introduced related to the appointment of a guardian, and to certain provisions concerning that appointment, which were made under my advice. On Lady Verinder's death, the will was placed in the hands of my proctor to be proved, as the phrase is, in the usual way. In about three weeks from that time, as well as I can remember, the first warning reached me of something unusual going on under the surface. I happened to be looking in at my friend the proctor's office, and I observed that he received me with an appearance of greater interest than usual. "'I have some news for you,' he said. "'What do you think I heard at the doctor's commons this morning? Lady Verinder's will has been asked for, and examined already.' This was news indeed. There was absolutely nothing which could be contested in the will, and there was nobody I could think of who had the slightest interest in examining it. I shall perhaps do well if I explain in this place, for the benefit of the few people who don't know it already, that the law allows all wills to be examined at doctor's commons by anybody who applies, on the payment of a shilling fee. "'Did you hear who asked for the will?' I inquired. "'Yes, the clerk had no hesitation in telling me. Mr. Smalley, of the firm Skip and Smalley, asked for it. The will has not been copied yet into the great folio registers, so there was no alternative but to depart from the usual course and to let him see the original document. He looked it over carefully and made a note in his pocket-book. Have you any idea of what he wanted with it? I shook my head. I shall find out, I answered, before I am a day older. And with that I went back at once to my own office. If any other firm of solicitors had been concerned in this unaccountable examination of my deceased client's will, I might have found some difficulty in making the necessary discovery. But I had a hold over Skip and Smalley, which made my course in this matter a comparatively easy one. My common-law clerk, a most competent and excellent man, was a brother of Mr. Smalley's, and, owing to this sort of indirect connection with me, Skip and Smalley had, for some years past, picked up the crumbs that fell from my table, in the shape of cases brought to my office, which, for various reasons, I did not think it worth while to undertake. My professional patronage was, in this way, of some importance to the firm. I intended, if necessary, to remind them of that patronage on the present occasion. The moment I got back I spoke to my clerk, and after telling him what had happened I sent him to his brother's office, 
with Mr. Bruff's compliments, and he would be glad to know why Mrs. Kipp and Smalley had found it necessary to examine Lady Verinder's will. This message brought Mr. Smalley back to my office, in company with his brother. He acknowledged that he had acted under instructions received from a client, and then he put it to me whether it would not be a breach of professional confidence on his part to say more. We had a smart discussion upon that. He was right, no doubt, and I was wrong. The truth is, I was angry and suspicious, and I insisted on knowing more. Worse still, I declined to consider any additional information offered to me, as a secret placed in my keeping. I claimed perfect freedom to use my own discretion. Worse even than that, I took an unwarrantable advantage of my position. "'Choose, sir,' I said to Mr. Smalley, "'between the risk of losing your client's business and the risk of losing mine.' quite indefensible, I admit, an act of tyranny, and nothing less. Like other tyrants, I carried my point. Mr. Smalley chose his alternative without a moment's hesitation. He smiled resignedly, and gave up the name of his client, Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. That was enough for me. I wanted to know no more. Having reached this point in my narrative, it now becomes necessary to place the reader on these lines, so far as Lady Verinder's will is concerned, on a footing of perfect equality in respect of information with myself. Let me state, then, in the fewest possible words, that Rachel Verinder had nothing but a life interest in the property. Her mother's excellent sense and my long experience had combined to relieve her of all responsibility and to guard her from all danger of becoming the victim in the future of some needy and unscrupulous man. Neither she nor her husband, if she married, could raise sixpence, either on the property in land or on the property in money. They would have the houses in London and in Yorkshire to live in, and they would have the handsome income, and that was all. When I came to think over what I had discovered, I was sorely perplexed what to do next. Hardly a week had passed since I had heard, to my surprise and distress, of Miss Verinder's proposed marriage. I had the sincerest admiration and affection for her, and I had been inexpressibly grieved when I heard that she was about to throw herself away on Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. And now here was this man, whom I had always believed to be a smooth-tongued impostor, justifying the very worst that I had thought of him, and plainly revealing the mercenary object of the marriage, on his side. And what of that? you may reply. The thing is done every day. Granted, my dear sir, but would you think of it quite as lightly as you do, if the thing was done, let us say, with your own sister? The first consideration which now naturally occurred to me was this— would Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite hold to his engagement after what his lawyer had discovered for him? It depended entirely on his pecuniary position, of which I knew nothing. If that position was not a desperate one, it would be well worth his while to marry Miss Verinder for her income alone. If, on the other hand, he stood in urgent need of realizing a large sum by a given time, then Lady Verinder's will would exactly meet the case, and would preserve her daughter from falling into a scoundrel's hands. In the latter event, there would be no need for me to distress Miss Rachel, in the first days of her mourning for her mother, by an immediate revelation of the truth. In the former event, if I remained silent, I should be conniving at a marriage which would make her miserable for life. My doubts ended in my calling at the hotel in London, at which I knew Mrs. Abelwhite and Miss Verinda to be staying. They informed me that they were going to Brighton the next day, and that an unexpected obstacle prevented Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite from accompanying them. I at once proposed to take his place. When I was only thinking of Rachel Verinder, it was possible to hesitate. When I actually saw her, my mind was made up directly, come what might of it, to tell her the truth. I found my opportunity when I was out walking with her on the day after my arrival. "'May I speak to you?' I asked. "'About your marriage engagement?' "'Yes,' she said indifferently. "'If you have nothing more interesting to talk about.' "'Will you forgive an old friend and servant of your family, Miss Rachel, "'if I venture on asking you whether your heart is set on this marriage?' "'I am marrying in despair, Mr. Bruff, "'on the chance of dropping into some sort of stagnant happiness "'which may reconcile me to my life.' 
strong language, and suggestive of something below the surface in the shape of a romance. But I had my own object in view, and I declined, as we lawyers say, to pursue the question into its side issues. "'Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite can hardly be of your way of thinking,' I said. "'His heart must be set on the marriage, at any rate.' "'He says so, and I suppose I ought to believe him. "'He would hardly marry me, after what I have owned to him, "'unless he was fond of me.' "'Poor thing! "'The bare idea of a man marrying her for his own selfish and mercenary ends "'had never entered her head.' The task I had set for myself began to look like a harder task than I had bargained for. "'It sounds strangely,' I went on, "'in my old-fashioned ears. "'What sounds strangely?' she asked. "'To hear you speak of your future husband as if you were not quite sure of your sincerity of his attachment. Are you conscious of any reason in your own mind for doubting him?' Her astonishing quickness of perception detected a change in my voice, or my manner, when I put that question which warned her that I had been speaking all along with some ulterior object in view. She stopped, and, taking her arm out of mine, looked me searchingly in the face. "'Mr. Bruff,' she said, "'you have something to tell me about Godfrey Abelwhite. Tell it.' I knew her well enough to take her at her word. I told it. She put her arm again into mine, and walked on with me slowly. I felt her hand tightening its grasp mechanically on my arm, and I saw her getting paler and paler as I went on, but not a word passed her lips while I was speaking. When I had done, she still kept silence. Her head drooped a little, and she walked by my side, unconscious of my presence, unconscious of everything about her, lost, buried, I might almost say, in her own thoughts. I made no attempt to disturb her. My experience of her disposition warned me, on this, as on former occasions, to give her time. The first instinct of girls in general, on being told anything which interests them, is to ask a multitude of questions, and then to run off and talk it all over with some favourite friend. Rachel Verinder's first instinct, under similar circumstances, was to shut herself up in her own mind and to think it over by herself. This absolute self-dependence is a great virtue in a man. In a woman, it has the serious drawback of morally separating her from the mass of her sex, and so exposing her to misconstruction by the general opinion. I strongly suspect myself of thinking as the rest of the world think in this matter, except in the case of Rachel Verinder. The self-dependence in her character was one of its virtues in my estimation, partly, no doubt, because I sincerely admired and liked her partly because the view I took of her connection with the loss of the moonstone was based on my own special knowledge of her disposition. Badly as appearances might look in the matter of the diamond, shocking as it undoubtedly was to know that she was associated in any way with the mystery of an undiscovered theft, I was satisfied, nevertheless, that she had done nothing unworthy of her, because I was also satisfied that she had not stirred a step in the business without shutting herself up in her own mind and thinking it over first. We had walked on, for nearly a mile, I should think, before Rachel roused herself. She suddenly looked up at me with a faint reflection of her smile of happier times, the most irresistible smile I had ever seen on a woman's face. "'I owe much already to your kindness,' she said, "'and I feel more deeply indebted to it now than ever. If you hear any rumours of my marriage when you go back to London, contradict them at once, on my authority.' "'Have you resolved to break your engagement?' I asked. "'Can you doubt it?' she returned, proudly. "'After what you have told me?' "'My dear Miss Rachel, you are very young, "'and you may find more difficulty in withdrawing from your present position than you anticipate. "'Have you no one, I mean a lady, of course, whom you could consult?' "'No one,' she answered. "'It distressed me. "'It did indeed distress me to hear her say that. "'She was so young and so lonely.' and she bore it so well. The impulse to help her got the better of any sense of my own unfitness which I might have felt under the circumstances, and I stated such ideas on the subject as occurred to me on the spur of the moment to the best of my ability. I have advised a prodigious number of clients, and have dealt with some exceedingly awkward difficulties in my time, 
but this was the first occasion on which I had ever found myself advising a young lady how to obtain her release from a marriage engagement. The suggestion I offered amounted briefly to this. I recommended her to tell Mr. Godfrey Ablewhite, at a private interview, of course, that he had, to her certain knowledge, betrayed the mercenary nature of the motive on his side. She was then to add that their marriage, after what she had discovered, was a simple impossibility, and she was to put it to him whether he thought it wisest to secure her silence by falling in with her views, or to force her, by opposing them, to make the motive under which she was acting generally known. If he attempted to defend himself, or to deny the facts, she was, in that event, to refer him to me. Miss Verinder listened attentively till I had done. She then thanked me very prettily for my advice, but informed me at the same time that it was impossible for her to follow it. "'May I ask,' I said, "'what objection you see to following it?' She hesitated, and then met me with a question on her side. "'Suppose you were asked to express your opinion of Mr. Godfrey Ablewhite's conduct?' She began. "'Yes.' "'What would you call it?' I should call it the conduct of a meanly deceitful man. "'Mr. Bruff, I have believed in that man. I have promised to marry that man. How can I tell him he is mean? How can I tell him he has deceived me? How can I disgrace him in the eyes of the world after that? I have degraded myself by ever thinking of him as my husband. If I say what you tell me to say to him, I am owning that I have degraded myself to his face. I can't do that.' After what has passed between us, I can't do that. The shame of it would be nothing to him, but the shame of it would be unendurable to me. Here was another of the marked peculiarities in her character disclosing itself to me without reserve. Here was her sensitive horror of the bare contact with anything mean, blinding her to every consideration of what she owed to herself, hurrying her into a false position which might compromise her in the estimation of all her friends. Up to this time I had been a little diffident about the propriety of the advice I had given to her, but after what she had just said I had no sort of doubt that it was the best advice that could have been offered, and I felt no sort of hesitation in pressing it on her again. She only shook her head and repeated her objection in other words. "'He has been intimate enough with me to ask me to be his wife. He has stood high enough in my estimation to obtain my consent.' I can't tell him to his face that he is the most contemptible of living creatures after that. But, my dear Miss Rachel, I remonstrated, it's equally impossible for you to tell him that you withdraw from your engagement without giving some reason for it. I shall say that I have thought it over, and that I am satisfied it will be best for both of us if we part. No more than that? No more. Have you thought of what he may say on his side? He may say what he pleases. It was impossible not to admire her delicacy and her resolution, and it was equally impossible not to feel that she was putting herself in the wrong. I entreated her to consider her own position. I reminded her that she would be exposing herself to the most odious misconstruction of her motives. "'You can't brave public opinion,' I said, at the command of private feeling. "'I can,' she answered. "'I have done it already.' "'What do you mean?' "'You have forgotten the moonstone, Mr. Bruff. "'Have I not braved public opinion there, "'with my own private reasons for it?' "'Her answer silenced me for the moment. "'It set me trying to trace the explanation of her conduct, "'at the time of the loss of the moonstone, "'out of the strange avowal which had just escaped her. "'I might perhaps have done it when I was younger. "'I certainly couldn't do it now.' "'I tried a last remonstrance before we returned to the house.' She was just as immovable as ever. My mind was in a strange conflict of feelings about her when I left her that day. She was obstinate. She was wrong. She was interesting. She was admirable. She was deeply to be pitied. I made her promise to write to me the moment she had any news to send. And I went back to my business in London with a mind exceedingly ill at ease. On the evening of my return, before it was possible for me to receive my promised letter, I was surprised by a visit from Mr. Ablewhite, the elder, and was informed that Mr. Godfrey had got his dismissal, and had accepted it that very day. With the view I already took of the case, the bare fact stated in the words that I have underlined 
revealed Mr. Godfrey Ablewhite's motive for submission as plainly as if he had acknowledged it himself. He needed a large sum of money, and he needed it by a given time. Rachel's income, which would have helped him to do anything else, would not help him here, and Rachel had accordingly released herself, without encountering a moment's serious opposition on his part. If I am told that this is mere speculation, I ask, in my turn, what other theory will account for his giving up a marriage which would have maintained him in splendour for the rest of his life? Any exultation I might otherwise have felt at the lucky turn which things had now taken was effectually checked by what passed at my interview with old Mr. Abelwhite. He came, of course, to know whether I could give him any explanation of Miss Verinder's extraordinary conduct. It is needless to say that I was quite unable to afford him the information he wanted. The annoyance which I thus inflicted, following on the irritation produced by a recent interview with his son, threw Mr. Abelwhite off his guard. Both his looks and his language convinced me that Miss Verinder would find him a merciless man to deal with when he joined the ladies at Brighton the next day. I had a restless night, considering what I ought to do next. How my reflections ended, and how thoroughly well-founded my distrust of old Mr. Abelwhite proved to be, are items of information which, as I am told, have already been put tidily in their proper places by that exemplary person, Miss Clack. I have only to add, in completion of her narrative, that Miss Verinder found a quiet and repose which she sadly needed, poor thing, in my house at Hampstead. She honoured us by making a long stay. My wife and daughters were charmed with her, and when the executors decided on the appointment of a new guardian, I feel sincere pride and pleasure in recording that my guest and my family parted like old friends on either side. End of part 31